naturalistic processes can't explain the moon, therefore it must not exist. The lack of supernovas limits the age of our universe, and of course, we dive into the mailbag. This is Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by the supporters of CORE Ottawa, citizens for Origins research and education, and exclusive right here on YouTube. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, broadcasting this week from the secret labs at Project Cadmus. We bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and we'll give glory to the creator while doing it. You can find us at wazulu.com or genesisweek.com, or click the ever-so-convenient subscribe link up top, and you can also peruse other episodes by following the links in the upper corners of each episode. I'm your host, Ian Juby. This past week, a report came out in Nature Geoscience comparing the isotopes of moon rocks with terrestrial rocks. Now, there are multiple models out there which attempt to explain a naturalistic origin of the moon. In other words, a way for the moon to form without a creator. Now, the Bible is pretty clear that God created the moon. Verses such as Psalms 8.3, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. In Genesis 1, we see God creating the heavenly bodies for signs, seasons, and times. And in Psalm 104 and 19, we find the moon is clearly considered one of those celestial bodies. He appointed the moon for seasons, the sun knoweth is going down. Now, the naturalists deny any involvement of creator and thus like trying to explain how a car came into existence without a creator, the naturalistic theories just simply crumble. The, origin, the original theories ruled each other out and had impossibilities within each of them. And so a new theory was proposed, which seems to have held its ground the longest, the impact theory, which goes something like this. Earth was in its initial stages of formation when it was struck by a planet, possibly one to two times the size of Mars. This led to a ring of lavas and rocks which coalesced into Earth again and the Moon. So, if this were the case, then the Moon in particular should have a different composition than Earth, as it is the combination of material from Earth and this alleged planet, Theia, that got pulverized when it slammed into Earth. Now, comparisons of oxygen isotopes on moon rocks had already been carried out and basically found the isotope ratios were identical, meaning the rocks were basically identical to Earth rocks. The latest Nature article compared titanium isotopes between the moon rocks and Earth rocks as well, and found those ratios were identical as well. Now, this all calls seriously into question the impact hypothesis, as the mineralogy should be different if the moon was produced by a planetary collision. To top it all off, such a planetary collision would have produced so much heat that the moon would have had to have formed from lavas, therefore there should be no water in the moon rocks. Now, a couple of years ago, the L Cross project, NASA bombed the moon with two rockets which kicked up lots of water. Now, back in 2008, tiny volcanic glass spheres taken from the moon soils were also found to contain water, indicating that the water came from deep within the moon, and the quantity of water might even be comparable to the quantities of water in Earth's rocks. Now, last year, Spike Paceres was just releasing his second volume of What You Aren't Being Told About Astronomy. He was quite excited to include some of this most recent research in his DVD, and in his newsletter, that more water had been found in moon rocks. As Spike put it, Unlike the lava samples, which were likely to have lost some of their original water when they formed in eruptions, the glass beads would have locked up and preserved their primeval water. Therefore, this new analysis would be a more accurate measurement of how much water is inside the moon. It turns out that the moon doesn't have 10 times as much water as the giant impact model would allow. It actually has 100 times as much. Evolutionary astronomers are now faced with a serious problem. One of their model's major predictions has been disproved. And this model was the only secular explanation left for the moon's origin. 
Indeed, this last naturalistic model of the moon's origin was the only model that had sorta kinda stood, even though the model itself already had huge problems. The bigger problem was that the impact model had the fewest problems of all the problematic naturalistic models. In fact, it's interesting to note that this alleged collision was supposed to have taken place at least 4 billion years ago, yet we know that the moon is actually drifting away from Earth. We know how fast and we know why. It's been measured at a rate of about 4 centimeters per year. So, if you go back in time, the moon was closer to Earth. And if the moon was closer, the drifting is more dramatic. So the farther you go back in time, the closer the moon was to the Earth, and the faster it got closer to the Earth. To the point where the moon would actually be touching the Earth a mere 1.5 billion years ago. Now there have been lots of claims and pronouncements made boldly all over the internet that this lunar recession problem has been solved, but a look at the actual evidence shows that this pro problem most certainly has not been solved. All of the naturalistic models of the moon's origins collapse under the scientific evidence. Such fatal problems have led people like lunar scientist James Shapiro to quip, the best explanation was observational error. The moon does not exist. So I'm going to make a prediction. All of the profound evidence that the moon has no evolutionary origin will be swept under the rug and poo-pooed because the obvious explanation that the moon was created is simply not acceptable to too many people. Not because of the evidence, but rather in spite of the evidence. Just last week, professional and amateur astronomers spotted a new bright light in the M95 galaxy. A supernova had erupted and was named SN 2012-AW, a spectacular explosion becoming an incredibly bright star virtually overnight. Supernovas bring up a very interesting point with regards to the age of the universe, however. Based on astronomical observations, galaxies typically have a supernova about once every 25 years. Now, these explosions are huge. The explosion from what is now known as the Crab Nebula could be seen in the daytime for weeks in the year 1054. Now, the remains from these massive explosions, called supernova remnants, should be visible for millions of years. So not only should we see at least thousands of supernova remnants in a universe billions of years old, we should also see lots of supernova remnants that have expanded large distances over time because they've had millions of years to expand. So just how many supernova remnants do we observe? So far, it appears that there's only a little over 200 or so that are unarguably supernova remnants. Such a figure agrees well with the universe that is only 7,000 years old. But that means there are thousands of supernova remnants that are missing if the universe really was billions of years old. So, are the supernova remnants missing? Or is it actually the billions of years in age that's really missing? Hmm? Woohoo! Mail for me! I forget. I'm supposed to cut the blue wire or the red wire? Or I could just pull the detonator. Hundreds of comments again last week, especially from those arguing for animals which eat meat today, or insects, such as what Looking for Dagoba mentioned. So what about spiders that make webs? An excellent question, but you need to remember something. You are judging the past from the present. A spider's web is useful for more than just catching insects. When we look in the fossil record, we see giant life forms and extinction of a lot of plants, of which we really do not know what all was lost in the past. A spider's web could catch high-protein seeds blowing in the wind, for example. Fish raised in the experimental hyperbaric chambers at Texas A&M in the late 80s and early 90s were growing yet not eating the food that was provided for them. Uh, it turns out they were eating the droppings from the birds, which were also living in the chamber, and were being sustained on the bird droppings alone. Now, in the hyperbaric biosphere experiments at the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas, copperhead snakes, which today are highly poisonous, showed a radical restructuring of their venom in a matter of days. Now, we don't yet know what this means yet, as more research is required, but for a snake to eat fruit, 
The venom could simply be proteins designed to dissolve fruit. The snake can't chew the fruit, so it bites it, injects a digestive fluid into the fruit, and then swallows the fruit whole, digesting it from the inside out. It's obvious from the fossil record that a radical environmental change has taken place in the past. What were the effects of this? Did we lose a whole pile of extremely high protein plants? It would appear also that the environment has become more harsh. It's interesting to note that it was after the flood that God specifically instructed Noah to eat meat, the same time at which the lifespan of humans drastically dropped, which would indicate a harsher environment, and probably now the need to eat meat, perhaps to replace the protein loss of lost high-protein plants. The research that has been done is fascinating, but more research needs to be done. It's so great to listen to you. You are doing such a great job. God bless you. Again, Ian, thanks. Brilliant. Ian, I love your videos. Thanks for putting out the truth amongst all the filth. Ian, another excellent video. I very much look forward to your videos every Thursday. I do have one suggestion, though. As a man in the military, you should work on your salute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure if I were in the military and I did that, I'd get a good slap upside the head for my poor salutemanship. No offense intended to my honorable military viewers. It's meant to be an honor to those I salute. Should be a small request to you and or your god. What is the definition of a kind of animal? Creationists do not seem to be honest of to share it with the rest of the world. Are you honest enough to do so? Well, thanks for writing in, although the offensive accusations of dishonesty were completely uncalled for. I would suggest the definition provided in Strong's Concordance. Groups of living organisms belong in the same created kind if they have descended from the same ancestral gene pool. This does not preclude new species because this represents partitioning of the original gene pool. Information is lost or conserved, not gained. A new species could, raise, could arise when a population is isolated and inbreeding occurs. By this definition, a new species is not a new kind, but a further partitioning of an existing kind. In response to Odonata's continual barrage of false claims and accusations, Machine Dean and Rod Carty made some interesting observations. I noticed that you guys are always asking that question, why doesn't science agree with creation? It's more like, why don't men agree with God? The reason why science does not agree with creation is really quite a simple one. They hate God. Actually, science does not disagree with creation. This is the fallacy of reification. Science disagree doesn't disagree with anything. It's people using science to gain knowledge who disagree with creation because they hate God. The Hateful Dead wrote in about the flood evidence I mentioned last week. In short, everything he lists here as being supportive of the Noatian flood has in reality long been explicable via known geological processes and are in most cases actually counter-evidentiary of any global flood. The last two listed, though, persistence of facies and facies indicating all continents subsided at once, are in effect non-statements, i.e. they are literally meaningless. Well, thanks for giving complete non-answers to the profound and powerful evidence I spent literally hours explaining in my videos. Funny how even though I went through the trouble of explaining each and every one of them in videos available for free viewing on YouTube, you simply chose to disregard them all. I would love to hear your explanation of things like the massive planation surfaces we find all over the world. Oh, oh, oh wait, let me guess. Glaciation. Glaciers flow downhill and carve gouges, not planation surfaces that are flat and level for hundreds of kilometers. Slow and gradual erosion produces differential erosion, not planation surfaces. In fact, many evolutionary geologists agree that only high-speed water will produce planation surfaces. You haven't refuted any of the evidence I mentioned. You just hand-waved and expected people to believe you, but thanks for coming out. Well, that's it for this week. I may take a hiatus from producing this weekly show as I need to get ready for two special exhibitions, and I hope you'll come out to one of them. If you're near Toronto, my museum will be on special exhibition at the Southern Ontario Creation Flood Evidence Museum in Goodwood, housed in the Goodwood Baptist Church from April 14th to April 22nd. Then I'll be set up at Coal Harbor Place, Coal Harbor, Nova Scotia, from April 27th through May 4th. There are, there are some possible other possible venues coming up, so check out my website for details, and I'll try and post more info here if other venues come up. Also, there will be a special edition of Genesis Week coming out on National Evolution Day this coming Sunday. If you're subscribed to my channel, you'll get a notification when the next Genesis Week comes out. In the meantime, I'll leave you with the words of our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said... I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. See you later.
Production software was provided for Genesis Week by the Big Valley Creation Science Museum, located just 25 minutes north of Drumheller, Alberta. Visit bvcsm.com for more details. You can help keep this program going by making a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4.